Well, hello everyone, welcome back from lunch. Um, and as you know, I'm Andre Beyond Swagger with Open Source Tools. Um, my handle on Twitter and also in uh, Write the Ducks, like if you're in that, is very thorough. I have to be careful how I phrase that sentence when I tell people, like, I'm very thorough in Slack. They'll go, oh, really? <laughs> oh, and you can also see these slides um, at the link down there, slides.com slash very thorough slash beyond swagger. Um, so uh, at the time that I, I wrote the proposal for this talk, um, it seemed like I had plenty of time for us to be doing the things that we said we were going to have done in the past. Um, but it proved to be a little bit of stumbling along the way and uh, not as smooth a saunter as we expected. Um, so we're talking about that journey. So first, a little bit about us as a team and about me. I, like he said, a documentation engineer at Netlify. And I just want to point out that I applied to and was accepted to and scheduled for the talk before we talked anything about sponsorships. Thank you for being a sponsor. <laughs> well, you can thank, thank the person who pays the bills for that. <laughs> um, and we are a service for developer teams to build, deploy, and manage modern web projects. And that's our fancy way of avoiding the word static sites because it doesn't necessarily have to be static, but front end sites that are deployed over CPU. <laughs> um, and most of the people who are working with what we make, it's not, they're not working with our API, they're working with our UI or with our CLI tool to deploy their sites. Um, Mostly for now, our API is being used by us. Our front end connects to our API. Our CLI tools use um, our API and um, are all connected using this uh, spec that I'll talk about. Also, I think it's worth pointing out that we are a very small team. Um, the whole company is, as of today, 46 people. Someone just started today. <laughs> and uh, last October, we doubled the size of our docs team from one to two, so woo! <laughs> That was pretty exciting. When I started two years ago, the whole um, company was 10 people. So um, there's a lot of things that, like, as we're moving as quickly as we can, and all those wonderful things you do in a startup, um, that we're still trying to keep up on. Um, so that's how these things came about. And that's how we got to our starting point, um, which is that we have minimal API task guides in our main docs. Our main docs are primarily about things separate from our API and how to use our platform and things like that. They're built with Hugo, a uh, static site generator, and there are some guides about how to do certain things in our API in there. Um, but it's one of the pages that I really want to give some more love to later. Um, and then we have an API endpoint reference, which is built from an open API document with Swagger UI. Um, so I know many of you are probably already familiar with this, but I'm going to go over it just in case so we're all on the same page about the things that we're talking about, especially because the word swagger means a lot of different things besides walking. Um, <laughs> and so it started as a swagger group spec, uh, which was basically when it comes down to it, structured content. It's a spec for making structured content to describe APIs. Um, and it was created actually for an online dictionary. Um, then the company that made it was bought by another company, SmartBear, um, and they open sourced the spec and renamed it to OpenAPI spec. Um, and so this is an example of a tiny part of a um, OpenAPI uh, definition file that tells you information about the API, like the name, the version, uh, the address for where you find it, and paths on it. Um, and it gets used for lots of different things as a single source of truth for API development. So it can be the glue that connects all these different parts. Um, in some cases, it can be generated from code. Um, or you can do it the other way around. Because in the end, it's not actually generated from the code itself. It's generated from content in the code. So like, even when we talk about automation in these things, like there's still somebody writing that somewhere. They're just writing it in comments in code. Um, and uh, the other way to look at it is to, for example, take Jenny's idea and go through and do your whole interaction um, interface design. And then when you come up with that whole list of all your inputs and all those things, you put it into your open API spec and you have a structured document to build from. And there are even tools for creating stubs to start those endpoints. Um, so you can actually have the 
the automation go the other way. So instead of going from the developers to the documentation, you can have the automation go from the documentation to the developers. And that's something that in our API we haven't gotten to yet, um, but it is actually a growing pattern in our organization of docs driven development. In fact, if any of you are going to the Write the Docs conference in Portland in May, I'm going to be talking about our journey in <laughs> documentation develop driven development. Um, so it can go either way on that, but it's connecting the code to the spec. Um, it can also be used to generate SDKs and docs, so clients in other languages can be generated from the same single source of truth. So everybody's working from the same structured content. Um, so ideally, it represents your API well. <laughs> um, ours does not entirely yet, because it wasn't always working in the right direction of things, but we're working on that. Um, now, the other meaning of swagger is after SmartBear bought, I think that a software company was for, forget, but uh, they put out the spec as an open source thing now run by the Linux Foundation, and then swagger became spec tooling. Um, and that includes the proprietary software as a service, swagger hub, swagger inspector, um, and then also open source tools, uh, swagger editor, swagger UI, and swagger cogen. So they have a variety of things, and a whole lot of the documentation about the open API spec is actually on the Swagger website. So they continue to be very tightly intertwined. Um, and you can see the reason why people get confused between the two. So this is our current state of our API reference docs, which I should point out, these are the reference docs. They're just one part, like someone said, it's like a dictionary. But dictionaries are important to have. You know? <laughs> like, when you're learning Arabic and I want to know how to say magazine in Arabic, I don't go to my Arabic textbook and go, which chapter would that be in? Probably the one about libraries and you know, try and find where it is. No, I want to go where it's in alphabetical order and I find the thing that I'm looking for and I can get it where I expect it to be. Um, and so it's one of the core parts of, it's obviously not all of your documentation, but it is one of the parts that is an essential thing. I know that as a developer, when I'm looking at an API, one of the things I often want to do is just go see what are the endpoints that are available. And different people approach these things in different ways. Um, so this is the current state of ours, is um, using Swagger UI, which is a tool that connects with your open API spec. It's actually pretty easy to set up. You put in like eight lines of code and a little static site, and you say, here's where my uh, spec definition is, and it creates a little site for you. Um, it's not the greatest site. <laughs> and I know many of you might be familiar with it. Um, it is, the organization is less than ideal, and some of the, the quality of it depends on the content that you put into it, which probably more content it still needs to be improved. Um, but um, the way that it's organized can be frustrating, I think, and can be a little bit overwhelming to find what you're doing. One of the benefits of it, though, is that it does have inside of it a built-in sandbox console for you to try things out if it's properly enabled. Um, so that's something that you won't necessarily find in other API documentation, as we'll discuss. So that's where we started. This is where we wanted to go. We wanted to saunter into the direction of, first off, better process. So moving towards spec-driven development, starting with the spec and developing from there. It's something we're already doing in our feature development. We write the docs and we develop to do it. We want to do the same thing with our API development. Um, also, better customer UX. So an improved site design, partly just that looks and feels like the rest of our stuff, but also that it's easier to find what you need um, inside of it. Um, and then finally, better writer UX. So that open API spec is a long document of all the different kinds of things you can put in, which this one's called, and how is this nested, and what kind of object can I do from it? And I don't care if you're going to start calling people technical or non-technical. I personally don't think that's a, a word you can apply to humans. It's the things that they do things with. But um, it's really nice to have a listing of the things that are available to you, what the names of those fields are, and how you use them, and not having to know, like, did this one have an underscore, or was it camel case? Just these things aren't always consistent. Um, and so looking for a graphical user interface for editing the file itself. And we also wanted to maintain some of our tech values, which to a degree is where Christoph and I differ. <laughs> <laughs> and so some of that has to do with 
being decoupled and modular, although I would say that using Drupal does not preclude being decoupled and modular, so we don't exactly differ on this entirely. Don't disagree. <laughs> um, but as things are separated, like opening up the ice bag, being something that is separate and a single source of truth means that you can use it in a variety of things and still have that all in one place, but not have to have everything built into one giant monolith. You can have different pieces working in different ways, and that's core to how we work, and it's the way that we think that the future of the web is, so it kind of fits with the way we do things. Um, another thing is pre-built portable markup. So the Swagger UI, as an example, is something that is loading the entire UI using JavaScript. So it's got this little tiny stub of a page, you tell it where your Swagger file is, and or your open API file, and it loads that using JavaScript, which it takes longer than if you've already got the HTML built for you. It has to download all the JavaScript, it has to pull in the data, it has to build the page for you. Um, so something that's core to the way that we work also is as much as possible having pre-built portable markup to start that view. It doesn't mean you don't have interactivity afterwards, but that's how you get it started. <coughs> and wherever possible, using open source. Partly because we are small, and partly because uh, it gives us room to adapt things and change them as we uh, go. Also, we have lots of documentation making customers, and making the work that we do open for other people to replicate is also something that's really useful for us. So, so the happy path describes the easier side of things, at least. Um, and that had to do with choosing site generators for this. There are actually a number of options out there. One of them, uh, LucyBot DocGen, this one has an open source demo version that you can use for open source non-commercial projects and uh, for demos, as they say. Um, but then they also have a proprietary version that has a little bit more feature set um, and is actually relatively inexpensive. It's $250 flat for, per API. So if you only have one API, you can do quite a bit with it. If you have a whole bunch, it gets more expensive. Um, and it includes, it's basically a reframing of that same Swagger UI that we had before. So it's taking that same information but organizing it in a different way. You have a navigation on the side. It still has that try it out button which takes you over to the console and you can execute things inside of the UI. Um, but I don't know. I find the UI has a little something to be desired. We can also improve it but it's also got limitations for us because we are commercial. So we could get a license. I think we could afford the $250. Um, but, <laughs> um, but I'm kind of moving on past that one. Oh, I should point out too that if you're on the slides, all these blue ones are actual links, so you can go and look at those things further. Um, another one that's also a uh, new skin on the regular Swagger UI is Rindoc. I'm not sure exactly how you pronounce that, or Rapidoc. So this one is another one that's generated straight from the Open API definition file, and also both of these ones are stubs building the UI with JavaScript. Um, but it all has kind of a nice design. They also have, um, so this, as you can see, looks kind of familiar like the Swagger spec, but I don't know, it took some extra nice looks with some of the design things, and it makes a little bit more use of the space. Um, they also have this um, component, Rapidoc. So it's taking that same thing and putting it into a web component that you could include in other projects which is kind of interesting, it's very portable and you just include this Rapidoc component and you can put pieces in different places and you have lots of customization options like fancy dark mode because everybody loves dark mode. <laughs> and another one, oh, and with that one, it's fully open source um, and uh, relatively easy to work with. Um, Redog is another one that has an open source version and a proprietary version. Um, and again, is one that builds from a stub in the page. But this one departs from the other ones in the sense that it starts to look like that three column API documentation that you might have seen from things like, well, now they've changed their docs, but Stripe's API docs kind of made that famous. Um, and it's similar to the Slate style, which I'm going to show in the next thing. Um, and so you have this where you have navigation on the left, information in the middle, and then samples on the right, and then as it's responsive, it actually stacks those together. Um, one thing it does not have 
that the previous examples had is a try it out console. If you pay for the paid version of Redoc, they have a try it out cons console in there. Um, one thing I thought was really interesting about this being that stub page that loads from JSON um, during the phase file, I was reading comments about the console feature that they decided they were going to put in paid. And they were talking about their real focus is performance because they talked about this professional API that happens to be one that we use for our payments. Um, that their API docs use this software and they've gotten the load time down to five seconds, which they're really happy about, because it used to be 45 seconds to load the page. <laughs> so that's an example of where when you put all that into one giant file that you're loading via JavaScript, probably not the best idea. Um, so. This one actually takes and builds the page in advance. This is actually a few different things put together. Slate was one that started out, built with Ruby and Metalsmith. Um, and someone who has the funniest to me GitHub name, Mermaid, M-A-D-E, so made by the sea, um, <laughs> uh, made a Node.js fork of that that's called Shins, which stands for Shins is not Slate. Um, both of these actually build the site from Markdown. So you actually have to convert the open API definition file to Markdown. And Wittershins is a tool made by the same person who made Shins that will convert the um, content from your open API definition file to Markdown so that it can be built out as a site. And the nice thing about these ones is that they are built straight in HTML, so you don't have to wait for the JavaScript to load and for the page to build. It's actually already pre-built. Um, there's still interactivity built onto that with JavaScript using um, things to make things show and not show. It does not have an integrated console into it where you can try out your API. But you can see this one's Slate, and you can see examples of the um, calls. And then Shins, very similar, but not Slate. <laughs> so there's some examples. So we had a few different options there and felt like, okay, I kind of know what I'm doing with those. Um, they're not quite at exactly the point where we want them to be, but it's something that we can easily start with and then add style and things like that. Um, where we really had a stumbling block was with the graphical user interface editing of the student file. Um, initially, I thought that path was pretty clear. Uh, we happen to have an open source project called Netlify CMS, and it seems to do everything you would need for this. You just need to hook it up. It's a little bit of work, not too bad. It works with data that's stored in files with Git. So you've got your open API spec file, you've got it inside of a Git repository. Netlify CMS works with files that are in Git repositories. It basically is a replacement for Git functions, and you can work in it in place in parallel with Git workflows. So API developers who don't want to use a UI can make Git commits and pull requests to that and change it without having to go log in somewhere and remember what was in my password for this, any of those kinds of things. But at the same time, if you're developing something and you can't remember what are my options for this or things like that, or you don't want to be working with Git, you have the option to use the UI. They can both work at the same time on the same document. Um, and it's geared for open source contributions. So if you have an open source API, it can be really good for working with that because you don't need to deal with licensing or things like that. And it has a file-based config. So the configuration of the CMS itself is something that you can store and version in Git along with everything else. Um, so you don't go, wait, why did somebody just change this setting or who did it? You can go look at a blame and find out. So, as an example, this is an example of a config of something on a site, plans for copy, actually, as it turns out. So this would be the config file for the CMS, and it says, okay, I've got a field, it's got a label of plans, uh, it's a list type field, and it has these other fields inside of it. There's a plan, a price, a description, items. You can see this is a description file, structured text, makes sense. That generates this in the CMS editor UI. So now I have the plans um, field, and inside of it, I can add multiple plans, and each one of those has the other information, the plan, this price, the description inside of that. And then what that does is, when you've used that UI on the back end, 
it makes a git commit and or a PR if you set up editorial workflow and saves to a data file. And so we have the sample file. Here's the plans, here's the description and items and the price and the size of the plan. So all of that information is data in a file generated by that UI. And then you can use that data to populate in a static site generator or some other tool um, to create a full site design using that data that you have. So all of those things, okay, data inside of files, and you just write up what the configuration is to do those. This is just made for this. It wasn't actually really that easy to do. <laughs> um, now, granted, our APIs, open API spec documents are not simple data files. So even some of those other ones that I was looking at, they can be pretty complex. They don't even touch <coughs> open API document spec. Um, so this is just an example of one tiny part of a spec, and you start getting these nested fields, and they all like nest on each other into this tiny thing. And so there's a few different things about them. First off, they are, like I said, heavily nested. They're also often really, really long. Like, we have a pretty small API, and already GitHub doesn't want to show us the diffs on it because the file's too big. So um, they can get really, really long and be pretty long. But um, they have limited modularity. So there are things that you can do. You can refer to another file or to another part of the file, but there are limitations on that. So for example, in paths, so this is an example, paths is a field where you put all of your endpoints under it. You can't go under paths and say a reference and say like, okay, all of my files that are inside this other folder, all my path files, put them here. <coughs> you have to say paths, say the name of the path, and then give a reference to that path, and do that for every single one of your endpoints. So that modularity is somewhat limited. And like I said, they have patterned fields. So as opposed to fixed fields, where you know what the name of the field is all the time, and I can go into that CMS config and say, this is the name of the field, and this is the kind of value you're going to be looking for. I can't say what the name of the field is, because it's not an actual name. It's a pattern. We make that up. The name of this field sites, there's nothing specific about the open API spec that that's specific about our API. So that made it extra challenging. And so I did some work to make some of that, and that's how we ended up with <coughs> this one. And that ended up this huge messy UI to edit like 10 lines. Well, to be fair, it's closer to 30, but still. Um, so at this point, using Netlify CMS to edit open API spec files, not happening. Um, there are some other options for now. Um, so one of them is Stoplight, which is a proprietary software as a service. You might have seen Stoplight for docs. They also have some um, other ways of interacting with APIs. They have Stoplight Design, which it only works with Open API 2.0, but they're working on three. They are working on it. Yes, they are working on three, but it is not there yet. Um, <coughs> well, you can edit the spec file as text inside of their UI, but they don't have the GUI editor for Open API 3.0, only 2.0. So they have this little design tab, and you can. It's, it's pretty neatly put together, and you can also sync it with the GitHub repo, so you can kind of imitate that um, PR process with content inside of a repository instead of having it locked into their UI. Um, another one happens to be the same person, that mermaid guy who did open <laughs> shins and water shins, and he's also on the open API spec um, working group. Um, and that one is open source, the UI for it is a bit clunky, though, um, and it doesn't sync directly with a Git repository. You have to import and export from web UI. So you can use their web UI, or you can also run it yourself and import and export that way. Um, and it converts to OpenAPI 3.0 on export. So if you put in a 2.0 doc, you're going to get a 3.0 doc out. So you better want 3.0. <laughs> so that one's got some limitations to it, but has some usefulness. So those are the ones that we have to work with depending on which spec. We're on 2.0 right now. I want to move to 3.0 so we have better authentication. Um, that's another conversation. But that's where we're at with that. Um, so having not quite sauntered all the way to having this wonderful thing, this is where we're looking at for our next steps. And one of the nice things about having a decoupled stack 
is that we can do different improvements in parallel. We don't have to go and decide what is the one tool we're going to use and figure all of that out before we start making changes and improvements. We can do change improvements in different places right now. And one of those is improving the customer UI. So we can take RapidDoc and we can adapt that as we want to. As we have more content, we can move to shins. At this point, I think it's more useful with the amount of content that we have in our OpenAPI spec to just use something that's more of a swagger wrapper. Um, but I would like to move to something that is more of a doc style when we have more actual docs content in there. And that leads to the other thing, which is <laughs> improving the content itself. Um, and some of that could be with Git editing of the file itself, but also the temporary UI options, because people don't necessarily know that there's a summary field, that there's a description field, and those things are very useful information as you're working through these things. Um, so using that to improve our content. Also, improving the editor itself. So now by CMS is an open source project, um, and we have contributors working on it, and then we also have two fault of people working on it in our own company. So working on things like custom UI widgets, they're focused particularly for this kind of file. Adding patterned fields to the UI, I've been doing a lot of work thinking about how we can make that happen in the way that we configure things. And then also conditional display. So instead of having to have a whole bunch of fields that you never use, that if you choose a field and you say, okay, I'm going to have this type, this is going to be a get request, then you get certain options for that. And if you choose a post request, you have different options for that. So you get different UI depending on which one you choose. Kind of basic stuff in some other areas, but something that's not in there yet. <laughs> um, and then something I'd like to do is do things to improve the modularity of our open API spec document. Um, and so that might be something along the lines of a simple file generator. So something that starts with a template and then builds the JSON or YAML file from that, going beyond the simple references that they have inside of the regular functionality of Open API spec. And, and that's all I have. So thank you.